Well, first off, I want to welcome everyone to uh, the July edition of Extension Hot Topics. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us today, Marguerite Bolt. Marguerite Bolt is our very first hemp specialist at Purdue University. Uh, she's been with us for about a little over four years now and has done quite a bit of work in the hemp industry. And we are really, really excited to, to have her with us here today. So, Marguerite, I'm going to go ahead and let you take over. And if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. We can, uh, I forgot to ask you earlier, do you want to take questions throughout the presentation or wait till the very end? Yeah. I mean, if people have questions or if I say something and it, it doesn't, you know, maybe make sense to you or you need a little bit more information, that's fine with me. Um, and then I'll have time at the end, I think, for some um, Q&A or discussion um, for folks. So okay. whatever people That's, feel more comfortable with. All right. That sounds good. So go ahead and put those questions into the chat and we will go ahead and moderate uh, between myself, Courtney, and I think Jessica is on here as well. So between the four, three of us, we will get those questions asked for you and we'd be happy to help you out. So uh, Marguerite, go ahead. The floor is all yours. All right. Thanks. Everyone can see my main screen. Yes, we can. That's good. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation uh, for me to talk about my hemp program. Um, I have been here for just over four years, um, but I've been in Indiana a little bit longer than that. So I'll talk a little bit about my background to get started. Um, I'm originally from Charlevoix, Michigan. For those that are unaware of where that is, it's about six hours north of campus on the Lake Michigan side of Michigan. Um, I grew up on a small, medium-sized specialty crops farm uh, mostly annual vegetables. And I had a really, you know, young exposure to agriculture, but my true love um, from a young age was insects. So I pursued a bachelor's degree in entomology. Um, so that's one of my favorite parts about working in the field is getting to see all the insects. And then I came to Indiana in 2017 um, for an opportunity to work on hemp, which I really didn't know a lot about at that point. My previous work was on tree fruit production and specialty crops, um, not in a sort of quasi field crop, specialty crop hybrid kind of space. Um, so I moved to Indiana in 2017 and did a master's in entomology looking at insect interactions in uh, field grown hemp. So I finished that degree. And at that time, the 2018 Farm Bill had just been passed um, and it changed the classification of hemp and it made it federally legal for people to grow it. And I accepted this position after I interviewed for it, they offered it and they created the sort of first uh, statewide hemp extension specialist in the country. Um, so that was really cool to kind of be the first, but also pretty scary because it's a very new, rapidly evolving industry. So I'm not sure if everyone's super familiar with what hemp is in the audience. So I thought I would just give a kind of quick overview of the crop and then sort of how it fits into this larger cannabis space. So people have some context because I've been working with it for a while, but I think sometimes um, I can forget that for a lot of people, this is still a fairly new crop or maybe you know a little bit, but, but not a ton about the plant itself. Um, so I put hemp and marijuana together because they are the same plant species, they're cannabis sativa. And so they look very similar. You can have interbreeding, um, but they're grown for lots of different purposes. And in the state of Indiana, we just have hemp. Um, we don't have legal, you know, high THC marijuana production in our state. I think it's now 39 states have some sort of marijuana program on the books, um, medical or adult use recreational, but we don't here. So we're going to focus on hemp. Um, it's an annual plant, so it will drop seeds in the late summer or fall, and then those will germinate in the spring. So it is an annual, it's not a perennial crop. Uh, it's also wind pollinated, uh, which is important for cannabis growers that don't want a pollinated crop. So if they're producing for CBD oil, they don't want pollen. Um, and in that photo there, that is a male plant shedding pollen. So you can tell it's, they're pretty fine granules. They can move long distances in the wind um, and it's dioecious. So we see it exist um, as separate male and female plants for the most part. Um, though breeders will select for traits where they'll have both pollen and seed structures um, on the same plants. So we, we typically see it as these separate plants um, with pollen producing 
plants separate than uh, the seed producing plants, but we do have a mix where we'll get both um, monoecious and dioecious out in the field. When we look at uses of cannabis sativa, we can kind of separate it into our two regulatory crops. So we have um, hemp, which is no more than 0.3% tetrahydrocannabinol. That's the psychoactive compound that you find in marijuana. Um, so really, really low concentrations. Just for a sort of um, frame of reference, if you were to go into a dispensary or read about dispensary grade marijuana or medical marijuana, that's usually 10% DHC or higher. So 0.3% is nothing. It's not going to do anything. Um, so hemp is bred to have really low THC, and it's going to go into products that use the fiber or the stock material. You can crush the seeds for oil. So we have seed oil, and then you get a byproduct from the seed oil called the hemp cake, which can go into food. In some states, they're allowed, allowing it into livestock feed, um, but that's not federally allowed at this point. And then we have cannabinoids. That's your CBD oil, other minor cannabinoids um, that are produced from the hemp plant. So the blue box um, to the left around hemp is our crop in Indiana. And we have marijuana um, in those 39 other states that have it approved. And that's a separate licensing program in those states as well. You have THC production, of course, um, and then you also have cannabinoids. So people will produce marijuana to also have higher profiles of things like CBD, CBG, all these different plant compound, compounds that cannabis produces can be derived um, from the higher THC varieties as well. So that's kind of how we separate the crop out. Um, and from this point on, I'm just going to talk about hemp. Um, and hemp research and what we've been doing at Purdue, um, as well as regionally in the Great Lakes area, and then nationally um, with national research projects. Everyone kind of got that? Anybody have questions about um, the, the plant itself? Uh, no questions on the plant itself. Okay, great. Um, so we will move on. Maybe. Okay, so generally um, for research and outreach, I like to look at plants and do plant research and I like to talk to people about it, but I do have some more specific goals um, for my research and outreach. And really my appointment was written as an outreach position, not a research position. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to have really great colleagues at Purdue and at other universities that have wanted to do research here in Indiana and to involve me in research projects. And so I have taken a lot more of a research focus in the last really two years of my program. Um, and a lot of that I think had to do with COVID. We weren't doing as many in-person outreach events. So I had a lot of extra time to dedicate to these projects. Um, now it's sort of ramping up again with more outreach events, um, but I've been able to get some grants with some colleagues and that has developed um, my research program as well. So my goals for research first um, are to identify suitable varieties in the state of Indiana. That's one of the sort of risk mitigation strategies that we want for our growers. We don't necessarily want them to have to try to figure out what varieties would work well here, especially since a lot of the genetics come from Canada and Europe and aren't necessarily that's suitable for our region. Um, so we're trying to work with some domestic bred hemp um, that's more adapted to the Midwest or just the US in general um, and trial those in Indiana. So that's part of the program is just figuring out what new varieties are gonna work and are available to our um, prospective growers. Observe pest weed and disease pressure, um, try to figure out what kind of management tools we can use, what's available, what may become available. I'll talk about pesticides in a little bit. Um, we're also evaluating agronomic management practices in the Great Lakes region. So I have a fertility trial out at the agronomy farm near campus. And then some of the um, partnering institutions I'm working with are also looking at tillage practices and planting date. And then I participate in regional and national research efforts. So I work in the sort of Great Lakes region with um, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And then we have a national research initiative um, called S1084, and it involves pretty much every land grant um, that has a hemp program in the country. And we sort of develop research protocols, try to figure out what's most important in various research areas. So I work a lot in the pest management section of that. 
For outreach, um, I'm continuing to engage with current and prospective growers. We just had a field day last week that had current growers. So we had some growers there, but we also had some folks that are very passionate about hemp, but aren't necessarily growing, but they're involved in the industry. So we continue to engage with folks like that, um, both on our on-farm research space, but also just doing what Extension does, boots on the ground, going out, interacting with um, our producers, figuring out what they need, um, and then educate non-hemp growers. So I do a lot of public events, um, really visible events. So events like this that are a little bit smaller, um, but maybe are going to be reached by a broader audience through recordings, but also visible in-person events. So I've done Spring Fest since 2019. Um, we did have that gap during COVID. Um, State Fair, I did State Fair last year for five days. Um, so that was a, a very different audience than what I would typically interact with. And then for the, the first time, I will be going to Farm Progress Show in Decatur, Illinois, um, and we'll have hemp plots planted out there. They planted those about a month ago, and we will be educating about hemp research out at Farm Progress Show. So trying to reach um, really big audiences as well, because you may um, imagine that there's still stigma surrounding this crop. There's a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding. We're still learning so much about this plant in general that we present new information pretty regularly as we learn, uh, but we get people that just don't know a lot about the plant. And so we're trying to educate as well and hopefully um, give people a little bit of information about what this crop actually is and what it can do. Anybody have questions about that? I'll talk a little bit about our completed projects. I don't have any figures to show for this because um, we're preparing publications, but I do have lots of photos. And if people have questions about kind of what we saw and what we did, I can talk about that. But I'm most excited about some of our ongoing research projects that started this year. So we did a cannabinoid or CBD hemp variety trial um, and a propagation trial. So this is just how do we propagate the crop? What type of management do we do in the greenhouse? And how does that affect the plants once they're in the field and our final yield? So that top photo is actually an aerial view um, taken by Ashley Adair, another ed extension educator. Um, in the, the photo, we have our rows of hemp plants that look kind of shrubby. If you haven't seen a CBD farm, they look um, kind of like Christmas trees from a distance um, or little shrubs growing. They're planted on wider row spacing. So our plants are six feet apart. And then I think we have about 13 feet between our rows. And we planted cover crops to manage weeds, which presented some problems with disease management. I was very humid in the plots. Um, we had a lot of fungal um, diseases growing in there. Um, this was back in 2021. It was a wet year. They just didn't do as well. Um, but we were experimenting with some cover crops for weed management because prior to this spring, we didn't have any conventional herbicides available for use in hemp. And weed pressure is one of the biggest causes of yield loss that our growers report. And then we have uh, 2021 and 22 grain and fiber variety trials. I have a photo in the bottom that shows flowering plants. So we have um, that sex differentiation. We have our male pollen producing plants visible in the photo. And then um, our seed producing plants. So we predominantly focused on European and Canadian varieties. Um, we had a couple U.S. genetics from Colorado, um, but the trials this year are almost exclusively varieties that have been bred in North America. So that's a big change for us um, for these trials. And then there are other projects that I've been sort of involved in on an extension capacity, but not a research capacity. So there have been multiple product projects through entomology, looking at um, pest identification and management in both indoor and outdoor systems, um, looking at the chemistry of the plant um, and how that changes with different management, botany projects and plant pathology projects, looking at weed pressure. Um, there was a really large organic rotational research project with hemp that's finishing up this year um, that was out of botany and plant pathology, um, where they were looking at how hemp fits, fits into organic corn and soybean rotations with the incorporation of cover crops in the like traditional fallow season and looking at weed management, um, pest pressure, yield. So that's a, a huge question that I get asked is if I fit this into my rotation, where does it go? And that was one of the things this grant was trying to figure out. 
or at least get an introductory idea to, because it is going to take a long time to really answer that question. Um, and then lots of horticulture project, projects. So that top photo where you see the wider row spacing, um, usually CBD growers are on growing on plastic. They have raised beds. They're using trickle tape underneath the plastic. Um, they're often hand pruning and harvesting those crops. It's more like a horticulture crop in its management. And so the horticulture department had several faculty working um, on research as well that has, I think, mostly concluded at this point. So we start um, for the cannabinoid projects, we start all of our seeds in the greenhouse um, in flats. And so we take the individual seeds, we plant them in a propagation media, and then we put them under LED lights um, for about five weeks and let them grow up four to five weeks and then transplant them out the out in the field. And so we have these tiny little seedlings that we plant in the beginning of June. And then they often grow into six to seven foot tall, massive shrubs um, with stems that are about four to five inches in diameter and are very woody. And so last year we actually used electric and gas powered chainsaws to cut these plants down um, like we were cutting trees. So it's a very intense crop to manage. It's not highly mechanized. There are some equipment modifications to things like tobacco harvesters that people are using, but it's predominantly a lot of hands-on labor for this crop. And so they start to flower, you monitor for the THC content, and then you harvest, dry, and strip the plants um, for processing. So again, very intense management. These are some photos on the left. We have um, 2021. This was what it looked like most weeks. We had these big storms rolling in. Um, so a lot of disease pressure, plants that were kind of falling over because the soil was so saturated and they didn't have great root structures. And then we have the opposite the following year. So it's very, very dry, but we were irrigating. So the plants did great um, and we didn't have the same kind of disease pressure. So we had really good yields um, last year, really impressive plants and they were massive. Again, we had to use those chainsaws for the first year we used um, big like tree loppers and could get through those stems. Last year, they were just huge. And then for our grain and fiber trials, um, on the left, we have some fiber stalks. So those plants are seeded like a, a forage crop. They're really, or like wheat, really, really dense, high populations per acre. Uh, and then we take mowers and we cut those and get um, plot yield estimates. And then we can extrapolate that out to pounds per acre. Um, so we cut the whole stock material down for these trials. And then for grain, uh, which is on the right, we just cut the upper portion of the plant, thresh the seeds, and then we can get pounds per acre for our seeds. Um, so we did this um, out at our specialty crops farm in 2021. And then last year was actually a first year of growing out at the agronomy farm. Um, which was really excited because I'm in the agronomy department. So we planted out there. It was pretty dry um, in June and July, and so the plants didn't do great. Um, we've had a better year this year, but we um, we're overall pretty happy that we get to be at the agronomy farm now. Anybody have questions about the last two years of research? No? Okay. <clears throat> Please stop me if you have questions. Um, but again, we'll have time at the end. So for our 2023 trials, we have some really cool projects going on. Um, we got, I think this is our fourth or fifth um, ag seed. For those that aren't familiar, ag seed is a sort of internal College of Ag funding program to get um, preliminary data for application for larger grants to maybe test different methods out, to just sort of have a smaller amount of funds to do some experimental stuff in the beginning stages and then hopefully be eligible or, or be able to get some larger grants um, to expand upon those initial studies. So we got a, a ag seed to work with the food science department um, to look at quality evaluation of both grain and fiber. So prior to really last fall, we started working with food science um, there wasn't much of a focus at Purdue and at a lot of universities on the post-harvest applications. So what does the quality look like coming out of the field and what can we do with it, which is super important. Um, we know we can grow it and we're trying to figure out some of the nuances to production and really determine best agronomic management practices. That's going to take a long time, but what we need right now is 
products? What can we turn it into that's feasible? What do consumers want? And so food science is working with us to look at the quality of grain coming out of the fields, looking at variety differences that might be important for post um, harvest applications, but also looking at the fiber itself. So do we have differences in fiber quality across varieties? And one of the things that some of the students did in food science is they actually took a hemp product um, and turned it into a baked good for a competition. So that's the image you see there. We have uh, hemp muffins or muffins hempified. And the goal of this project was to create a shelf stable baked good that had high dietary fiber from a novel source. So what they did is they took hemp cake, which is that byproduct of crushing the seeds for oil. It's really high in protein. So nutritionally, it's really great for people who are plant-based um, because it has all the essential amino acids, which we don't see in a lot of plant proteins. We see it in um, soybeans, but with hemp, it's really digestible proteins, which is great. And then high dietary fiber, which we are sorely lacking um, in the standard American diet. So they made this pretty delicious muffin um, with that hemp cake. And then they put some hemp seeds, roasted hemp seeds on the top and entered into this competition. They did not win, but that recipe has since um, been featured at a lot of events. Food Science make mu makes muffins for me for pretty much all the outreach events I do at this point. Um, so they were able to make this baked good, um, but one of the parts of the grant is to develop novel products. So not just integrated it into food, especially meat alternatives, but packaging, food packaging materials. So um, they're working on some sort of novel applications of the stock material into food packaging, um, which I will share once our patents filed, it's very exciting. Um, but they're really focusing on what happens next, um, which again is one of the biggest areas of research that needs to be developed um, for the hemp industry. We also have a United States Department of Agriculture Supplemental and Alternative Crop Grant. So this is a multi-state trial in the Great Lakes region. So I'm working with three other universities and a nonprofit, as well as USDA in Peoria, Illinois. They're gonna test some of our products or our um, harvested material for us. And I threw up a little picture there because um, it was so cute. We have a tree frog that's been hanging out in our plots for the last couple of weeks, um, just eating insects, being in a, a nice moist environment. We don't spray any um, pesticides on the plants. And so it's, it's just kind of hanging out there. Um, but we're looking at different varieties across four states. I mentioned this is the first year that we have um, varieties that are just from North America in this trial. So we have a grain and fiber trial um, replicated across the Great Lakes region um, at multiple research farms. We also have these crop management trials. So we have a fertility trial. Um, and then the other states are looking at uh, tillage practices and planting dates and how that relates to yield and plant performance. Um, we're also doing pretty extensive pest and disease surveys out in the field. So we're collecting materials, sending it to um, a diagnostic clinic, and then they're determining what we're seeing out in the field. Um, and then we're working with farmers. So a big part of this grant was to have on-farm research trials. And so we have about 20 growers across the Great Lakes region that are doing larger strip trials of varieties that we have in the smaller plots at the university research farms. So we're getting sort of this small plot research, but we're also applying um, these varieties to larger trials um, that farmers are managing with their own practices and they're collecting data using a smartphone app. So we're working closely with hemp growers um, to look at a, I would say a more applied or realistic application of these hemp varieties. We did have one question since oh, you're on the test, test sure. plot. Um, somebody was asking, do you have any trouble with uh, people or individuals bothering your test plots? That's a great question. Um, when I first started, all of the hemp was planted at our specialty crops farm because it has a 10 foot lockable fence. And that was a big concern about people coming in. And generally the, the plots would be kind of set where they weren't super visible. I've never had any issues. Um, usually when I'm out at the farm and if you go to the, any of the events at the agronomy center, um, they're right behind the innovation center. Um, so feel free to go walk around, but never had any issues. Theft was a problem in 2019 for some of our growers producing CBD hemp. So they would set up security 
um, cameras. It wasn't required. Fencing isn't required to grow the crop. But we did have some people deal with theft. Local law enforcement were very helpful. I think some of the people got caught, some didn't. Um, but they weren't going and cutting all the plants down. Maybe they would take a couple plants here and there. Um, what they were doing with it, I'm not sure. Because <laughs> um, it's not, it's not going to have a psychoactive effect. Um, but maybe they didn't know that. Um, but yeah, it's, it has not been an issue. Most of them, people just want to come out and check check out what's going on, um, see the plants, take some pictures. But other than that, it's it's been pretty easy. Um, another question I get is, aren't you worried about getting pulled over? I often smell pretty aromatic after working in the field. Um, and I often transport plant material. Everyone who grows hemp in the state has to be licensed, including researchers. So I have a license with me um, and I've never, I haven't been pulled over in years. So I've never been super concerned about it, especially working at the university. Okay. And then another question came in. Um, are you, do you, from your research plots, do you sell any of the product in any form? Oh, and then somebody also asked, do you expect the uh, inedible hemp or the muffins uh, to be, per be available for purchase at any time? Yeah, so we are not allowed to sell any material from the plots. Um, part of that is just with the university. Part of that is we sign transfer agreements with the companies that distribute the seed. And so we have to you know, do our post-harvest quality measurements. We can look at product development, but we can't sell from that material. So for the muffins, um, I don't anticipate them selling those at this point. Um, I do have a recipe on our website. We're going to put it on the main page so it's more visible. That's been adapted for home kitchens um, for folks who want to do that. That material that goes into the muffins is commercial. You can use commercially available hemp seed cake. It's not from our plots. It's not something we've processed um, that goes into the muffins. For the commercialization of products, um, we would have to go through Purdue with that and then also get approval um, to use the material in those. And we're producing such low quantities that it wouldn't be feasible for commercialization. The plots are only 75 square feet. Um, so it's just not enough material um, at this point, except for us to experiment with. Any more questions for now? Uh, that'll be it for right now. Okay, great. Um, so another, here's some photos of the trials. Um, on the left, that photo was taken at the end of June. Um, it's a month after growing. They're not super tall. Most of them are about mm, three and a half feet. And then the photo on the right is one I took yesterday. Um, so most of the plants are over my head at this point. Um, some of the varieties will continue to grow. Some of them are starting to set seed. So they're not going to get too much taller. Um, but we will continuously harvest those as they become mature throughout the growing season and get those yield calculations and then get that material for the post-harvest quality measurements. So we were out there yesterday, they look really good. Um, they're growing very healthy at this point. And this trial will continue on for another two growing seasons. So it's a three-year funded project um, with the variety in the agronomic trials. And then we'll continue to hopefully expand the number of growers that we work with on these trials um, as time goes, in, goes on. For the pest management part, we're doing some cool stuff. So I'm out going out and scouting plants with a, an undergraduate student that's working with me. And we're collecting plant tissue samples, but we're also looking at spore movement. And I thought it was kind of cool um, to show this trap. So on the left, we have this spore catcher for fungal spores. Um, and what it is is this little motorized device. Um, and that's that black cylinder. And it's hanging from one of those tall plant hooks, shepherd's hooks. Um, it's 84 inches tall, so it's um, sort of above the plant canopy. And then this motor spins this metal, these metal arms that have uh, microscope slides, so glass slides coated in Vaseline. And what that does is spores move through the air. Um, they get intercepted by these um, slides and they'll get sent out to the plant clinic and they'll look at um, the slides and determine what spores um, are being caught. And then we'll be scouting you know, throughout those plots and see if the spores we're catching are, you know, infecting the plant material and what's kind of just flying around in the environment, but isn't necessarily affecting the plants. 
Um, one of the things that we're really interested in is looking at diseases that affect yield, of course, but those that affect the grain as it's developing that could be concerning. Um, so things like botrytis or your gray mold that you can often see when you have um, like strawberries in the fridge that go bad, you get that gray fuzzy mold. Um, that's one that can affect hemp and cause degradation in the tissue. Um, but another one, fusarium, that we see a lot in wheat, um, a head blight that can actually produce toxins that can be detrimental to the human and animals can also infect hemp. So we're really interested in seeing um, what we're catching in the traps and then are we seeing that in the um, later maturing plant structures and those seed heads. And then, you know, is that something that we need to be concerned about from a toxin standpoint? Um, so we'll be looking at that. And then on the right, um, sort of set back, you can see this white trap um, suspended on a pole and that's called a heliothus trap and that's catching moths. Um, we have a pheromone lure that's attracting the moths. And then we're focusing on species that we see in our landscape, corn earworm and European corn borer that can attack hemp plants. Um, so we're trying to get a, a general count of moths that would be flying into the plots with these traps. And so we're doing monitoring um, throughout the rest of the growing season for these particular pests. We also have this really cool device coming. Um, it should be here at the end of August. Uh, it's called a Herdmaster Micro Decorticator. So we have the stock material, um, but hemp is different in cotton in that the fiber comes from the stock itself. Um, so it's it's called a ba bast fiber, um, kind of like jute or canaf if you're familiar with those natural fibers. And the fiber exists on the sort of exterior of the stock. We kind of think of it like the bark um, of the, the plant. And so to get that material, we need to separate it. And you can do that by hand. It's very laborious. Um, what processors do is they have these devices called decorticators and you run dried stock material through it and it breaks and separates that outer sort of fiber from the inner herd, which has its own applications. We go into things like building materials, um, animal bedding, they're using it for kitty litter. Um, it can be pulped for paper. And then the, the best is going to be things for like your textiles, your non-woven technical uh, 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 textiles, things like um, paneling material that's made from non-woven fibers. That's going to come from the outer material, the outer bast. And so we actually were able to get um, a donation or a small endowment from a person who is very invested in the industry um, to purchase this piece of equipment and it's for plot level. So it's only about 72 inches long. It's pretty small, but we'll be able to run our stocks through there and get the separation of the bast and the herd. And then that material can go to food science for um, post-harvest quality and product development. <coughs> Excuse me, you had a little bit of a cough. We also are working on a regional level um, with our North Central Integrated Pest Management Working Group. So this is a program that um, isn't hemp specific. They work with a lot of um, crop researchers that are in both emerging and like high priority areas. Um, so we have a hemp specific working group that we've had for the last couple of years. And we actually got uh, another grant to continue this program to develop educational materials um, focused on both pest identification and management. So we're developing a, a better database of diseases, insects, and weeds for our North Central region and some of the management practices. Um, and it's focused on integrated pest management. So not just what can we spray on it and kill, but how can we actually manage our crop in a way where we hopefully reduce pest pressure or minimize damage caused by these pests. And so this is a very, I would say more outreach focused grant. Um, it's about developing educational materials and, and really working with folks to help them sort of develop their knowledge on pests and managing those. Um, and then we're also highlighting hemp growers throughout our North Central region as part of this grant through a grower spotlight um, interview. So we've done one of those so far this summer. We have a, another one, I think, in the works for later this summer. We've interviewed um, a couple that are growing hemp in um, greenhouses down in Southern Indiana and sort of some of the challenges they've had with pest management, um, the challenges and success they've had working in this industry, 
Um, we're going to go to Illinois later this summer and interview um, some growers there, sort of same questions, see what their struggles are, how they're managing, um, and sort of their involvement in the industry and, and, you know, what things look like them for the future. We also, this is one of the coolest ones I think that I'm involved in. I say that about all the research projects. They're all very interesting to me. Um, but we are working on another supplemental and alternative crop grant with University of Wisconsin. I think University or yeah, Minnesota, University of Minnesota is also working on this. And this one is focused on feral hemp or ditchweed. Um, so some of you may be aware that we have what we call ditchweed growing throughout the state, but predominantly in the Northwest um, section of Indiana. And that's what this photo is from. It's these ditchweed plants growing um, on field borders up in the Northwest side of the state. And these are sort of leftover populations from when we grew hemp uh, in Indiana in the 1940s for World War II. And so county um, like weed boards and the state used to spray these to try to kill them. And then they kind of just like, eh, we're not going to do that anymore. So we have these populations of hemp throughout our north central region um, that are sort of locally adapted. Um, they grow really well here. And so what this project is looking at is collecting the germplasm from those populations. Um, so I participate in this. I go out and collect plant samples um, for this trial and send them off to Wisconsin. And they do lots of genetic tests on them to figure out um, what traits might be worth investigating further to breed um, these locally adapted cultivars. So things that are going to work really well for our region. Um, they're not going to flower really early, which happens with our material from Canada and from Northern Europe. It's just not adapted for our latitude. And so it'll flower shortly after um, June 21st as daylight starts to decrease. Um, and that doesn't really work when the plants are only a couple of feet tall. We want these tall plants for fiber production. And so this is going to be really important for trying to get cultivars that work in our area. And so this, this trial is focusing on that for the next couple of years. And so we'll be collecting more material from Indiana and sending that off to Wisconsin. Um, and hopefully through this program, there'll be some material available to growers that um, isn't privately owned. So it'd be publicly owned through a university. So some of the challenges that we've had this year um, and really these aren't necessarily unique to just this year, but one of them is delay in seed shipment. So material coming from Canada has to go through customs and that can often sit in loading docks. And so we had some delays in our shipment. Um, so I wasn't able to plant until May 26th, but we were ready to plant about May 15th. Um, so if you wait longer to plant the crop, you have less time for vegetative growth and they just don't get as tall and aren't gonna yield as much. We had drought conditions early in the season. Um, so right after planting, we were really dry. We didn't get a rain until um, June 11th. So I actually had to move sprinklers around to irrigate these seedlings um, so they didn't just die. Um, again, this is not unique to hemp, but it is something that we struggle with. We just didn't have the irrigation infrastructure set up out at the farm to be able to deal with those drought conditions. Um, if we would have been able to plant a little bit earlier while there was a lot of soil, a lot more soil moisture, um, we would have had better established plants and maybe wouldn't have had to irrigate at all. But some of the kind of progress that we've had in the industry is, I mentioned earlier, a conventional herbicide available. So we call those section threes. Um, we had a section three herbicide registered in hemp. It's our first conventional pesticide in general that is approved in the US for use in hemp. Um, and we were able to get that material and use it. And we had really good weed management in our plots. It was dry, that, that helped um, with the seed germination, the weed seed germination. And we did do a little bit of manual weed control between the plots before canopy closure, but still out there, we have very little weed pressure between the plots where we have those walkways. Um, just not a lot of weed pressure, which is, huge because I mentioned growers report that as one of their major causes of yield loss um, is weed pressure. We're also getting higher quality seeds. So we're getting seeds that have higher germination. They're a little bit more vigorous. They're just doing better um, than previous years. We've dealt with some pretty bad seed lots um, coming out of Europe 
part of that again is if they sit in a um, like shipping container and while customs inspects them for multiple weeks, we're going to have a loss in seed quality typically because they're not going to be stored properly. Um, and that photo is just early season, earlier in the season from one of our plots. Um, one of the really cool things about hemp when you're planting uh, a dense seeding like this is once you manage the weeds in the beginning of the season, you get a really nice canopy and they sort of suppress the weeds. <coughs> So not much is growing underneath that canopy at this point um, because it's just so dense and shaded. Um, for outreach this year specifically, we had um, our Ag and Natural Resource um, leadership educators go out and visit one of our local hemp farms in Tippecanoe County. So I like to try to feature farmers if they're willing to have people come out. And we've had some on-farm field days in previous years. Um, but we had some of our extension folks go out and see this sort of seed to shelf operation. So these are growers that are getting seeds, starting them indoors, transplanting them, harvesting, drying, processing, making products, and then selling them. So they do everything on farm. Um, it's a small operation. They grow less than two acres of hemp, um, and it's run by a husband-wife couple. And they've been doing this successfully for the last, I think it's three years now. Um, or they're going into their, yeah, they're going into their third growing season. So we ha do have growers like that in the state that are completely vertically integrated. Um, so they're doing everything. We also had our field day last week, like I mentioned. Um, that photo is two of our researchers from food science um, that are working on that post-harvest and, and product development um, side of things. So tried to have sort of a whole picture of, of what's going on at Purdue right now. I also wanted to put this up here. This is um, a figure of production acres in Canada. And I wanna bring this up because I'm gonna show a picture of production acres in the US over time. So we have um, year on the bottom on the x-axis and then um, thousand production acres um, on the y-axis. And this just shows over time, we have this you know, legalization in 1998 of production in Canada. Then you have sort of a peak the next year and then it goes down and then you have a gradual increase and then it goes down and you have this sort of pattern over time. Um, and we see a sort of similar trend in the US where we have low production acres 2015 through 2018. That was the sort of pilot program in USDA. So we don't have federal true legalization of hemp um, until after um, the end of 2018. So at that point states were deciding kind of how they ran their programs, like Kentucky, Colorado, some of the Western states allowed for sort of what I would say more commercial production where growers could actually sell their harvested crop. Where in Indiana, anybody who wanted to work with the university and grow a crop had to destroy it. So they couldn't actually make any money off of it. In 2019, USDA removed hemp from the Schedule I narcotic list because um, it was classified as a Schedule I drug with marijuana um, prior to the end of 2018. And so in 2019, this allows for commercial production across the U.S. and interstate commerce, which is a big thing. So they could, growers could safely ship material across state lines to be sold and processed. Huge peak, lots of overproduction of CBD hemp, and then we have a decline. I'm not sure what 2023 will look like. I think it'll be similar in terms of production acres, maybe a little bit of an increase as we, as we have more fiber processors go online across the country. Um, but I think we're gonna see that sort of similar trend um, like Canada has seen over the last um, you know, 25 years. Some of the gaps in the industry, anybody have any questions? I'm finishing up, so I will have time for questions at the end. Yeah, there is a couple questions here. Okay. Um, <laughs> So one of the questions is, is the Netherlands hemp processing plant still coming to Indiana? Uh, this particular person has been unable to find any current info on it. That is a great question. I just spoke with that group earlier this week and they're working on the build out. So they've had some delay in their funds, but I've been assured that it's still coming. And they did contract with um, a small amount of growers this year um, and last year to get, excuse me, some of that um, stock material ready to go in. So the answer is yes, I'm pretty confident that they're gonna be operational. When that opens up, I cannot say. 
Okay. And then back to your trends there. I know in 2019, you showed the peak production there, but mm -hmm. why do you think um, we had all that production in 2019 and then it kind of tailed off here towards in the last couple of years? Yeah. So 2019, first year of commercial production across the country. So states are allowing farmers to get licensed at this point. Uh, Michigan and Wisconsin are great examples of they did not allow anybody to grow. Indiana, like if you had a good relationship with the university, you could do some research like piloting. And we had, I think, two growers that had some research plots, but they had to destroy. So just wide allowance of production in 2019, a lot of talk of how um, much money could be made from especially Kentucky growers talked a big game. There were a lot of processors, very expensive million dollar facilities being built in Kentucky. So a lot of the acreage in 2019 was for CBD production specifically. And there were growers talking about returns in those other states of $50,000 an acre returns, which is pretty appealing um, for a crop. I mean, like that's a lot of money um, to be made per acre. So then at the end of 2019, in about, um, I'd say November, the price dropped drastically. Uh, because there was a lot of material now, just a huge, huge amount of material coming into processors, um, a lot of overproduction and not enough demand. And then in 2020, growers are aware of that. So they're not going to get as much for their crop um, at the end of the season. There's a lot of material left over from 2019, still going through processing. And then you have the pandemic. So we actually had pretty high registration um, in a lot of states in the beginning of 2020. And then when it was time to plant, especially for CBD growers, they didn't have the labor, um, they couldn't get material in, everything was shutting down. We just had a, a big drop because in 2021, you don't have that much of a change. 2022, again, we're seeing material still getting run through processors from 2019, 2020, and 2021. So there's a just like a backup of material, um, just a, a huge drop in CBD production. In fiber production, you need some pretty fancy processing equipment and you need people to buy that fiber and turn it into something. And that's a lot of new industries or old industries that need to be redeveloped. So textiles, for example, we outsource most of our textile production in the US. To try to bring that back is just a huge undertaking and it's gonna be slow. And so I'd say a lot of the fiber and grain growers, they're row crop farmers. Um, and hemp has to be competitive to fit into that space and to be something that a farmer is going to want to adopt. Um, I think, like I said, as more processors come online, we'll probably see an uptick. Um, but I'm thinking it's probably going to be more gradual at this point. Um, people are a little bit more apprehensive because of that huge drop that we had in 20, at the end of 2019. Okay. Uh, another question here is, can individuals smell the plants that are in the fields? Yeah, um, that I've gotten calls and complaints about this, not for my plots, well, a little bit for my plots, but mostly from people that are growing in more urban spaces, um, so there's just more people around. Once the plants start to flower in particular, they produce and release a lot of um, volatile organic compounds. Um, so I mentioned like CBD and THC and those cannabinoids, those don't have the aroma. It's your terpenes. Um, and they have a lot of terpenes that you see in hops. And those are actually in the same plants uh, family as cannabis. Um, they produce pine based terpenes, um, terpenes that you see in citrus, lavender, mango. It, it produces a ton of these aromatic compounds. And that's where you're going to get those aromas. Um, so yes, right about now is when you're going to start to sort of increase that smelly factor, um, and it'll get worse as the plants mature um, and produce more of those compounds. So people have called and complained. Um, there's not really anything I can do about it, um, except say I'm sorry. It is a very aromatic plant. Um, it does smell better than feedlots, I will say that. Um, and then I have had people comment on how I smell in my office um, because I do store some dried material in here. I get pretty stinky out in the field just walking in the plots. Um, it's a really resinous plant and that sticks. Um, 
So it's not a lot I can do. I wash my clothing in vinegar to try to um, get those compounds off. But yes, smelly, smelly, smelly plant. All right. And then one last one here. I think it'll get us caught up for what we've got now. Uh, so what is the importance regarding uh, controlling the pollination of the plants? Is it strain improvement? Yeah. Um, so there's kind of a couple different ways or things that we think about when we want to reduce pollen or eliminate pollen flow. Um, first off, the question is, do you need to eliminate pollen. In a grain and fiber system, you don't, and actually you want it for seed set. Um, so we don't care about that so much, unless you're trying to breed, then you need to have setbacks, and probably setbacks of at least 10 miles. Um, so you just want to kind of have an isolated field. For CBD production, it's very important to not have pollen flow because you don't want seed set. You're going to get generally a reduction in your cannabinoid yield, um, and then you're going to have a really heavily seeded crop, which processors don't want. So ways you can mitigate that, um, try to grow in an isolated area and have buffers. Um, so that could be wind breaks. Those could be other crops that are going to be taller, whether that's a cover crop. I've seen hemp grown within a cornfield. Um, that's one way we can minimize pollen flow is just isolation. Um, another thing that we can kind of think about, say that you do have a neighbor that is producing a grain or fiber crop. If we know what the genetics are and we see how they perform here, we know when they flower. We collect flower data for all of our varieties. So we know when flowering starts and we know when it ends. If you can select a CBD genetic that we also have that information, it's a timing thing. So if your grain or fiber is pollinating, but your CBD crop isn't flowering yet, it's still vegetative growing, vegetatively growing, we have a mismatch. Um, and when that pollen could actually reach the flower. That's a little bit trickier because we do have extended flowering periods where males will shed pollen for several weeks. So that's challenging. And then the third option, and this is a breeding practice, is triploid hemp. So I think most people are familiar with seedless watermelon. That's the best example that I have. It's a, a triploid crop, so it won't produce viable seeds. You get those little kind of like white underdeveloped seeds you can do the same thing in hemp. It's pretty easy to do. Um, so there are companies that are breeding triploid hemp, and I've grown some of those. You don't get seed set. You just get those little underdeveloped kind of like white looking seeds, and you get very, very few of them. So I don't think a processor would really care. You're not going to get a knock in, um, you know, yield reduction. That's probably going to be the safest bet if you're concerned about pollen flow. And breeders like this too, because they don't want people saving seeds. So if you get pollination of your CBD crop and you go, hey, I'm going to save these seeds and plant them for next year, um, growers have to sign transfer agreements as well, just like they do with a lot of other crops, hybrids, you know, these genetic modified crops, things that breeders are spending a lot of um, money and time and intellectual property rights and all that stuff. Um, we see that in hemp as well. So that also helps with that seed saving concern that some of these companies have. You just, you can't save the seed because there's nothing to save. All right, that gets us caught up, so. Okay, cool. And I am almost done. I'm gonna talk a little bit about gaps in the industry. Um, one of them is local and regional processing. This is a tool from the Hemp Industry Association. They have this interactive fiber and herd supply chain map and the purple bubbles there's i think like i don't know how many six of them something like that one two three four five six there's six of them kind of spread throughout the u.s um those are the processors not a lot um and we talk about the economics of fiber production your farmers are producing literal tons of baled fiber per acre it's probably not going to be economically feasible to ship those hundreds and hundreds or thousands of miles to a processor so we want regional or state um, specific processors. We don't have a lot of those. Um, I'm not sure if the one in Michigan's even operational. The one in Kentucky pretty much just serves that sort of area around Murray, Kentucky. And then the one in um, Southern Illinois, right by the Missouri border, also serving, you know, just that sort of um, area around Southern Illinois, um, West, Western Kentucky and Missouri. So we don't really have anything that our growers, um, in Indiana or Ohio um, or Wisconsin could really get to. Um, 
unless that Michigan one is currently processing. I don't think they are. So just not a lot of processors for the fiber side. Uh, grains one that also we don't have a ton of processors. There's a, a bigger one in Kentucky and then a very, very large one in Montana. Um, and then some people doing some smaller processing um, for the grain. But Canada's, I think, the number one country for grain production. So they really have taken a hold of that market. Um, but I think that could change um, if animal feed is approved. We could see more grain production in the U.S. Regulations, that's an area where um, regulations are changing pretty frequently. We're in a farm bill year, and there is language in there specific to hemp. Um, trying to sort of ease the regulatory burden for some of our growers because it is still such a regulated crop. Licensing will never go away, I don't think, um, or at least not in the immediate future. But I think there's a lot we could do to improve, um, you know, that burden on growers. So that's one of the, the areas where, you know, it's overwhelming to get all this information, learn about a new crop, and then you add that regulatory component. You have to fill out licensing. You have to do a lot of reporting. The crop has to get tested. There's risk if you have THC content that's too high, um, which we've done a lot better job with more frequent testing for our farmers. So better timing of harvest. Um, but regulations really could improve in the industry. Um, competition with other crops. With an underdeveloped industry, what's the motivation for growing something that we don't necessarily have the processing capacity and there are risks associated with it? And so we have a fair amount of um, growers that maybe can absorb um, some costs and, and maybe aren't quite as risk adver adverse. Um, maybe they have a small area of land that they you know, just wanna try an experimental crop on. So they decide to do hemp. Um, but if prices for other crops are high, um, what, what's the motivation for growing something like hemp? And at this point, we have a lot of sort of innovators or early adopters um, that are in the hemp space because that's what they do. They, they want to innovate and try to integrate something new into their rotation. Um, and again, maybe aren't quite as risk um, averse. Consumer perception. There's another one. How's the industry going to develop if we um, don't have people who are willing to buy? And that's changing as consumers are looking at more um, natural fibers, maybe trying to kind of get away from synthetic fibers. More auto manufacturers want to incorporate natural fibers into different components of vehicles. So that's a big thing. Um, so consumers probably don't even know about that. Uh, but a lot of manufacturer, car manufacturers want their composite material to be a blend of both synthetic and natural fibers. So things like that um, need to continue to, to grow and expand um, to get hemp products into things. Um, Meat-based or plant-based meats and, and those meat alternatives is another area that's growing and hemp fits really nicely into that space because of its, its protein profile. Um, it's also high in fatty acids. So omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, which is good for people who um, aren't eating fish. That's where you see a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. You get omega-6s from a lot of plants, but you don't see omega-3s as, as common in plant material. And so hemp has um, a pretty good ratio of those fatty acids. So good for, for plant-based folks. Um, and then research. There's always more research we can do with any of our crops, but hemp has so many unanswered questions outside of just growing it, right? There's a lot of questions on optimizing breeding, on what varieties are going to work for different products. And that's really, again, what food science is trying to look at for the food science application, but there's building applications for the material. Um, there are people who are looking at making um, batteries from hemp. So using the carbon as a source of graphene, um, but are there certain varieties that might be better for that application? So a lot of areas of research that we can continue to develop. And um, as we produce more, um, we're and have more growers engaged because, of course, you know, we get a lot of input from our stakeholders on what research questions we might want to ask and what they're seeing on their farms. The more growers we get, I think the more questions we're going to have um, and, and be able to, you know, have a more ro robust research program moving forward. <clears throat> so I am done with the talk. My last slide is just lots of people who have been involved over the years in the project and our funding sources. Um, 
but does anybody have questions? Oh, actually, sorry, I have one more thing. Um, additional resources. I think Courtney said that she's going to send out an email with um, the link to the video and, and resources, but I have three main websites that I like to refer people to. There are a ton of um, university-based resources out there, but I have our Purdue Hemp website, um, which has information on production, events, um, just general information on the crop. Um, the state chemist, so the Office of Indiana State Chemist is our regulatory agency in Indiana. They do hemp, fertilizer, feed, pesticides, seeds, all kinds of stuff. Um, so they're our regulator. They're housed on the Purdue campus. Um, that's if you are interested in hemp or just learning about the regulatory information, that is where you're going to want to go. You're going to want to go to their website. And then Midwest Hemp Council is a nonprofit focused on hemp um, policy and education. And we work pretty closely with them on events and outreach. And they um, don't just cover the, you know, Indiana, it is a Midwest organization, but they are housed out of Indiana. So those are the sort of three um, resources I like to plug, plug. But again, there are a ton of really great sites out there from universities and other nonprofits that have really good information, USDA, um, has hemp pages that have some great in, insight. Um, so definitely check those out. And then, yeah, I'm done. Um, this is just a list of a ton of different people across the university, the Midwest, um, that have participated, collaborated, coordinated, done all kinds of, um, you know, events with us um, and research with us. So I'm very grateful that it's been um, collaborative in nature. And we've been able to work across multiple departments and universities to do this research. Do you happen to have your uh, slide for your contact info? You know, I didn't put it up here for whatever reason, um, but I can put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, um, we have somebody asking everyone. about that. Yes, usually I do, and I don't know why I didn't for this one. I just slipped my mind. Okay. Well, does anybody have any last questions? I know we're a little bit over time today, but uh, Marguerite, I do want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and just talk to us for an hour and give us your perspective on the hemp industry and where it's going and what we've seen so far and sharing your research and what, what you have done so far. So um, with that, if no one has any other questions, I'll let Marguerite put her contact information in the chat, but we're going to hang around for a couple extra minutes here. But and other than that, we are finished up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Awesome. Oops, I think I, yeah, let me get this. I put it as a direct message. My bad. Um, um, do you have a, a graphic for a hemp plant anatomy that um, you would recommend? We've had a question. Um, I could send it out with our follow-up email with the resources. Yeah, I can. Um, there are a ton out there. I can pull one. Um, I have a couple different ones, but I'll pull one and I'll send it to you. Okay. And then do you have like a easy graphic for uses of hemp too? Yeah, I have. I, I don't know how easy. It's pretty easy. I do have a graphic for uses um, that I can send as well. It'll, <laughs> I don't know if you want that. I can just put them as a PDF. That'd be. That'd be fine. Okay, yeah. perfect. Can you put your contact info? Can you send that to us with the follow-up? That would be easier than the chat. Yep, I will include that as well. I, I just want to thank you so much. A friend of mine is building a hemp house in another state, and <laughs> she had to get the materials coming from the Netherlands. So I'm super yes. that Indiana, that you're the first hemp extension agent in the country. Is that what you said? Yeah, someone that is solely dedicated to hemp and is a statewide specialist. As far as we know, we're we're not aware of anybody else. Um, now there are more people, but in 2019, it was a pretty novel. Oh, oh. Yeah, now there are more. There are more of us. Um, okay. uh, but yes, yeah, first in 2019. Because I you've I had no idea there was such insect <laughs> issues because the big reason she's doing it to be sustainable, but also <clears> it's <throat> to be like fire resistant I think but I thought disease resistant as well as breathable that we're talking about a house yeah yeah so once it's um turned into that building material so for the yeah. insulation or the hempcrete they mix it with lime and right. when you mix it with that lime sort of substrate 
you do get the fire resistance. You're not going to have the sort of insects and disease issues because of the lime specifically. Um, She's bl buying blocks. They're specific blocks. They're like, yeah. like the Netherlands. Yeah, those are really, really cool. And there is a, a company in Nebraska that's working on um, a material like that where it's those sort of Lego blocks. But um, I don't think it's available yet or else mm -hmm. that's the one that has plastic on it and she doesn't want any plastic. Yeah, those ones aren't, they're not available. They're working with University of Nebraska Lincoln engineers to get a load bearing block. So a lot of the hemp building materials at this point are um, for insulation purposes, which is great. Um, but there are not very many that are approved for load bearing. Um, the engineers had to approve everything. I don't remember the whole bit on that. But. Yes, yes. It's um, hemp, more hemp materials for building are getting approved in international building codes. And actually I'll have, for the email that goes out, I'll also put a link. There's a U.S. Hemp Building Association. Right. Yeah, yeah, they're awesome. They have so many resources and they're working very hard on this sort of like code approval process but yeah when you build anything right you have to go through like local approval um and some like zoning boards aren't gonna necessarily approve hemp materials long, though because pennsylvania is pretty progressive in the way of hemp yeah, yeah. Way down, but great. yeah anyway thank you ever so much i'm gonna leave enjoy your day and congratulations Bye-bye. <laughs> wow.